Oracle Red Bull Racing said, hey, we need to shoot a launch for our RB19 because they needed it to be delivered in six weeks and virtual production solved that. If you could change the speed of content creation, how might that change your campaigns? How might that change how you approach filmmaking as a whole? Welcome to VP Land, where we explore the latest in filmmaking tech from virtual production to generative AI and everything in between. I'm Joey Dowd, your host, and you just heard from Hannah Draper, Global Head of Production at Final Pixel, and Michael McKenna, CEO of Final Pixel. Final Pixel is a virtual production house specializing in film, TV, and advertising, but they do more than just creating content. They have a growing training academy and dedicated virtual art department, which we'll explore more. In this episode, we'll learn how they pulled off filming the Red Bull racing spot that Hannah was just talking about without access to the car or drivers. We'll dive into how virtual production helps with reducing production costs and risk mitigation. We've kind of halved the amount of time it would take to do a traditional production. Where they think AI fits into filmmaking in the future. I don't really think about AI as a thing. I see it more as a way of doing things that will be slotted into the pipeline somewhere. How rapidly changing technology is enabling more creative freedom. The more you're not worrying about the technology, the more freedom that you have to be creative. But it's live action filmmaking. It's live production. It's the live bit is what makes it what it is. And a whole bunch more. Get ready for lots of virtual production insights and stories from Michael and Hannah right here on VP land. So when you were getting into virtual production, I mean, for both of you, like what were, what were some of the roadblocks or what were some of the things that you kind of hit or just in shifting the way that you think about like making videos and uh, producing, like what, what were some of the shifts that had to happen? I mean, I mean, one of the biggest one was, was the virtual art department, you know, building the virtual art. So, you know, we had to start from a point where no one was doing this. Um, you know, so it was it, like, say it was like July, 2020, um, there was, there was other outside of the Mandalorian and maybe, you know, um, some other large, really large productions, nobody was doing this at scale. So we had to learn how to take Unreal Engine projects and get them optimized to the wall. And that was probably the biggest first challenge. You know, we wasted like a lot of money on that, <laughs> you know, and we learned, and, and you know, being honest, that was one of the big drivers for the education side as well, because. We just didn't want other people to like waste so much time and effort on it as we did in a way, you know, like we learned the hard way. Um, and so, you know, I still think we're one of the few companies that have an optimization video on our YouTube, like just available for people to watch, you know, and I think that that kind of dark art, if you like, could be able to take, um, to try and balance photorealism with the optimization for the wall is, um, was one of the biggest challenges and still remains like a big challenge. Um, but, you know, we've been working on processes and ways to manage that. So yeah, definitely the, the sort of, um, you know, creation of the art, having it running on the wall, that was a, that was a big shift. Then the, the second one of, or like in parallel is the, the change in, um, the change in mindset and approach from all the different stakeholders that's needed. So, you know, if you have to, you know, have a very different, um, kind of pre-production process with your director of production, uh, with your, um, director of photography, with the producer, you know, the heads of production with the production designer, with the director, like it, it is a real shift in mindset for how you approach filmmaking, particularly for people that have done a lot of VFX work. Um, and so I think, you know, those two things, you know, um, were probably two of the biggest challenges. And then, you know, what we've really had to do is, is manage that process. And, you know, again, that's where Hannah comes in, like she's been amazing at being able to help us create this, um, you know, tight workflow from end to end that helps manage that whole thing. Cause when you get the when you get that pre-production workflow right, you know, that's when you start to get the real best out of what happens on stage. To add to that, it's a lot about the um, kind of nurturing the mindset of when you've got a director or a DAP that's never worked with virtual production before and is still in that kind of mindset of, will it look photo real? You know, you have to, you have to work out how to tr get them to gain the confidence, first of all, in the technology, but also not be scared of it because it is new territory. And we like to take away the need to think about the technology so that, you know, the director or the DOP can think about being creative and getting the best visuals out of, out of it. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a way of managing and nurturing the confidence within um, the heads of department. Just to do a quick overview of what Final Pixel is and sort of the three areas that you're focusing in. You know, you think about our company, we are a specialist in virtual production, but we describe ourselves are as a innovation in film works, um, because actually we're, we're covering a lot more than a, a virtual production 
physical studio. You know, we are, are running production from the start, you know, from concept to final pixel for clients across advertising, film and TV. Um, this takes us into, you know, markets in the US, the UK, Europe, you know, Australia, Brazil. We've, we've done um, work internationally a number of times now. And, and so, yeah, we're not just one physical individual place. We have this global network. We have global reach. We have teams that can um, be deployed and can work on projects all over the world. So we have this production arm, if you like, you know, this kind of core um, production side, which, you know, helps to manage that overall process, but then also runs the on-set virtual production um, and then has a nice dovetail into our um, virtual art team. So. We have our own um, virtual art department. That's like the second pillar, uh, if you like, of the business, which, um, you know, runs Unreal Engine, highly optimized environments on the LED wall. Uh, we are building the next generation of content, you know, using this technology. Like uh, we're really trying to push the photorealism, really trying to push the optimization, really trying to push the creation time as well so that we can um, deliver for our clients. And then the third area, again, like this, this again, expands beyond simple, just individual studios. You know, we, we're a trainer, we have an academy. The academy operates again, internationally. Um, we've got a couple of initiatives that I can talk about in a bit, um, but you know, we have this, um, global reach with the academy again, through our online portal and also through our partners. And what this allows us to do is take, um, the knowledge, like the live knowledge that we're gaining on complex cutting edge virtual production shoots. And then translate that directly into skills based learning for people to go and, and pick up. It's, it's, I actually think there can't be many, if any companies out there that are doing it at the same speed and at the same kind of, um, level as we are, because we're taking this, you know, from one week, the, uh, virtual production supervisor might be using the latest version of Unreal 5.3 and doing the latest things in it. And then the next week he's going to be teaching all the heads of department across different high end TV and film programs, how to actually employ this technology. So yeah, like I think that that's always been a ethos, like we're sharing what we're learning about this technology and the ways to do it, because we don't ever really believe that it's just one, one single thing. You know, this is a way of filmmaking. It's not just one studio. It's like a whole approach. It's the way you approach things. Um, and that's something that, you know, if we're ever going to achieve the potential of virtual production is something that we have to get out there um, and share and, and get the craft and the storytellers coming back. So yeah, I think that there's, there's those three areas, if you like, of the business and ultimately what that allows us to do is take our clients requirements and take the, you know, the creative requirements from a client and employ production technology in a way that allows them to do things that they couldn't have done otherwise. What was the backstory and sort of the origin of getting into virtual production and, and final pixel? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like I, I'd spent a long time working in TV previously and, um, my, uh, co-founders, you know, uh, Chris and Monica had been running, a uh, um, creative agency in the U S now they'd been working more in advertising and, um, Chris is a director too. And, uh, literally this was almost become a bit of a cliche now. Like we, we were watching the behind the scenes of the Mandalorian over April, 2020 lockdown and, um, it actually came about from a family Zoom. Like, I don't know if you remember when everyone used to do this, like, weekly Zoom with family. So it was one of those Zooms that, I've, and then, you know, the other thing everyone done was talk about, uh, what have you been watching this week? You know, what's everyone been doing? And so we were all talking about The Mandalorian and Chris was saying, yeah, I was watching the behind the scenes. And, you know, we thought that if we had this LED wall technology, we could have kept shooting through COVID. You know, we had a client that had a, a shoot cancelled. And if actually we'd had this, maybe we could have done that shoot. And I was watching it and I, you know, I'd had these like parallel thoughts as well, which is, this is incredible. This is going to change everything. Like, I love this. I, it's for me, it's a combination of all the things that I love about filmmaking, technology, gaming, etc. And, um, at that point I was, I'd already decided I'm just going to leave my current role and go and just devote time to this kind of form of production. So it was a bit like serendipitous in a way and decided that, yeah, why don't we do something together? And then that's where it came from for us. Um, you know, my background before that, you know, came from camera, worked in camera, had also done a lot with uh, technology. So I was in working, um, you know, in, in various different guises of technology. And then also, um, on the production, you know, the, the, the film and TV production side, you know, I'd had good experience working in that area. So this for me was like a real coming together of all the passions that I've got alongside this like amazingly exciting future for, um, film TV production. And, um, and yeah, we went off and 
started some demos and then before we knew it, you know, we were really busy and we, we had like a, a wild ride since. <laughs> yeah, it's been mm-hmm. really great. Um, and Hannah actually joined us on the one of the first big productions we uh, we done in the UK and that's how we first met. Yeah, so what was your background, uh, Hannah? I'm more advertising, so I've come from like production company producing. Um, that's my background. I've done lots of commercials, music videos, a lot more short form stuff. Um, but I remember our first shoot that we did um, was a lot of fun because you're you've got a load of crew, especially in commercials, where they they kind of come up, they show up, they do their job, they go home. Whereas with virtual production, you're they're coming and they're like, wow, this is really fun and exciting and interesting. And everybody's got just a little bit more energy to to play and be super great at their jobs. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan, big okay. fan. Academic programs and stuff that you have. So mm-hmm. do you want to go more into what you've been? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we are, we're really pushing hard on this and, you know, at a level and scale, which is, um, you know, I think quite unique in the industry at the moment. So um, we've just launched a new program in Scotland. Um, which is in conjunction with Screen Scotland to run a virtual production fellowship. And the idea here is that, you know, a very forward thinking um, funding body in Scotland and, you know, the combined forward thinking partners, ourselves, Night Sky, Blazing Griffin, have managed to come up with a program which is much more qualitative and aimed at a smaller group of people rather than all of these kind of uh, what we're seeing a lot of is these kind of um, one day sessions where it's a kind of come in, see the stage, hear a bit about virtual production, then go away. It's quite a lot of that at the moment. And what we're really trying to do is shift the dial and actually invest in time and effort and, um, you know, be more strategic about trying to build up the teams that are able to do this sort of thing in different countries. Um, so working with the screen organization allows us to do that at a country level and at a level which is, you know, designed to sort of build that capability there. So this is a, a three-year program, and it will take sixteen people through a very, you know, the group carry them through this kind of end-to-end process. So um, the, the, within that um, sixteen people, there'll be four different specialisms. So there'll be people with a producer specialism, people with the more kind of a virtual art production design specialism, uh, people in the onset virtual production sort of specialism, and then the the creative kind of director or DOP side. Um, you know, so I think that this is going to be very different and yeah hopefully you know through the the mentors that we're bringing in and through the kind of approach to the teaching it will just prove that you know we have a model for building really strong virtual production teams um and and the sort of things that can and you know where this comes from is it's to help our clients ultimately de-risk the work that they want to do with virtual production you know like in order to deliver this well in order to deliver high production value vp you need to have good, talented, experienced teams. Um, and still at the moment, as it's very new, that's still a challenge in the industry and that's still something that is, is evolving. Um, but I really hope that what, by what we're doing, we're going to help cement more and more teams, more and more freelancers, more and more groups out there that can, that can turn themselves to us. Um, so that's one of the things that we're doing, which is fairly, mm-hmm. fairly major program. Yeah. And then there's also uh, just, you know, in a couple of weeks, we've got some taster sessions, which are aimed at more kind of come along to the stage, but these are in particular tailored toward the head of department again. So um, production design directors, DOPs, have them come into the stage, but actually like really experience what it's like to operate as well, not just come and um, have a go at uh, you know, looking at the wall and waggle a camera, kind of actually to try and put them in the mindset of, okay, how would how would we approach this as filmmakers? Like, how would we actually come to this? Because access to the technology tends to be one of the biggest barriers for storytellers at the moment is that, you know, they need to get hands-on on set. I mean, we really want to make that hands-on experience as good as it can be and as high in TV and film as possible. So in doing that, we've taken the, it's probably the largest volume in the UK, the one at the Ari stage. Um, so we're going to be in there in Ari, um, delivering this training over the course of two days for six day, you know, um, professionals. And I think it's, it's this kind of thing again, like this is what we're trying to do is put the, put the control and the technology in the hands of the filmmakers and the hands of creatives to, to actually see where this technology will take us, you know, like they're the, the, the experienced people who work in film and TV are the ones that are going to show us where this can go in terms of potential, you know, we want to bring those who are willing to go on that ride along. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, so, I mean, it seems like 
with there's like a multifaceted approach where it's like that some of it is like geared towards professionals that are already in the industry, but maybe want to learn more about virtual production and the three year program, I'm assuming that's like people that just want to start from ground zero. Yeah, exactly. To a degree. I mean, the three year program is actually sort of mid level. People have done a bit of film TV already, like want to move on. Um, we do have other programs aimed at, yeah, absolutely everything from, you know, complete beginners to um, people who are still at school. So we run, we run programs with um, uh, like summer schools for 11 to 18 year olds, introducing the real engine. You know, we've done this whole thing last year where they got to build their own like first meta human. And, and then this year we've done another summer school that was using Fortnite creator, sort of like going on and, and starting to build things in Fortnite and like understanding the concept of world building and the concept of using Unreal Engine. And the sort of, uh, the, the, there's just the pure like ease of creation that comes from it and um, to try and, you know, like just show people like, this is amazing. This is the kind of, few, this is where we're going with this kind of technology. Real time technology is going to be a bigger part of everyone's life. And, you know, having, you know, these, you know, 11 to 18 year olds kind of get hands on with it was just amazing because they're, they're, they pick this stuff up very quickly. Um, you know, they're, they're really native when it comes to anything like this and, um, it's really exciting, actually, you know, to see, um, you know, and also to show them, look, there's a number of different avenues out there. Like not, not everyone, you know, maybe wants to go to university and study a thing. Actually, there's other paths out there, particularly in film and TV, you know, there's apprenticeships, there's different, you know, ways to bridge that gap between further education into uh, the film and TV industry. So we're really operating at all levels and, um, Jodie, who's our head of Final Pixel Academy. Um, she has been amazing at just nurturing, you know, those groups, bringing them through, working with the partners across universities, across colleges and other further education to take training into universities, to sort of carry that training beyond, um, you know, just on set in the studio uh, with a small group of people. We've also just launched the first um, in-depth colour course. I think it must be one of the first, if not the only, um, in virtual production. Um, and we're working with Daniel Mulligan on that, who's a really experienced color scientist and is able to take us through and is taking a grip through at the moment. Um, all the sort of considerations, if you like, in the color pipeline, teaching them more and more detail about color and all the kind of complex stuff that comes with that. And I think, again, this has been one of the areas in virtual production that has been sort of the most challenging, but also the most exciting to work with, I think, you know, in color. Yeah. So yeah, like I say, we're, 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 we're coming at it from all different angles and the, the vision, the purpose there is to build skills based training. So, you know, training, which is clearly based around teaching people skills in order to make them more employable and actually ultimately be able to come on set and do the types of jobs that we really need them to do. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I never thought of that, but I guess it's not such a big leap when you're talking about younger, younger people, uh, like Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, they've sort of just been growing up with like world building and it's not such a big leap to go to unreal. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, the, the way we created 500 meta humans that time and they were all just so vastly different as well. It was amazing. Like, you know, the kind of creativity that went into it, some of them were just absolutely wild. Some of them like very photo, like trying to get them really real and personable. Like it was absolutely amazing. Like, um, you know, I do feel like there's a, there's a real wave coming with the, the sort of next generation in this area that are so, um, you know, gaming and native to this kind of stuff is, 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 is makes the kind of barrier between, you know, what we might think of as, you know, the, between immersive experiences, between games, between film and TV, like that next generation is, is, is the energy behind changing that and technology as well at the same time, you know, you can see that the, the sort of bridge between immersive entertainment and, you know, you know, what we would initially, you know, originally call film or whatever has really been broken down, like, you know, um, rapidly in the moment. Now would be a good time to mention the VP Land newsletter, which has a dedicated section for all virtual production related events, including the educational events put on by Final Pixel. So if you want to know what events are coming up near you or you have an event to promote, be sure to subscribe. Also email us if you have an event to promote. You'll also stay up to date on the latest news and behind the scenes insights into virtual production and the latest filmmaking technology. It's a totally free newsletter that comes to you two to three times a week. The easiest way to get it is to go to ntm.link slash vpland. The link is also in the show notes. All right, now back to the episode. Not to be a cliche, but I mean, obviously it's on everyone's radar. AI stuff, uh, but also beyond AI, nerfs. 3D, gauze and splats. Uh, how much of this is on your radar? How much are you thinking about this, especially in speed of creation for environments and or other uses and stuff? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, speed of creation environments is, is interesting, you know, concepting with this sort of stuff is interesting. Um, Gaussian splats are amazing, you know, like we were watching nerfs and then like now looking at Gaussian splats and how you employ these in a pipeline. But, you know, like I'm, I'm always thinking about how we use this to create the right sort of, um, you know, highest value production for our clients ultimately. You know, and like I'm always trying to translate it into okay, well, what element of the pipeline does this definitely help for the type of clients or the type of work that we do? Um, and one of the challenges in that at the moment, which I'm sure will change, is the, the the iteration. So, you know, we like I talked about earlier, the virtual art process. You know, to go back to that challenge, um, one of the big challenges there is is how you iterate from you know one design to another, and how you take notes and how you say, oh, okay, can we just move that there? Can we can we just you know put that up a bit and move that there and change the color here and actually, you know, like those notes are what really goes into embedding the value of virtual production because, you know, you're like, you're giving the client and you're giving the producer the viz, you know, before they're even on set and they're getting all that in, in advance. And, you know, I think having that, um, that tool, you know, to be so fine tuned with Unreal, um, is, is amazing. And to sort of some of them so far, most of the AI type uh, 3D gen stuff I've seen so far is a bit limited on that front and, and it's harder to do that iteration. So in the end, you maybe like save time and do something really quick, but then you might lose time if you were to sort of follow that same process. So I'm, I'm just really interested in how it fits as a workflow too. And I kind of don't, I don't really think about AI as a thing. Um, I, I, I sort of, I see it more as like a, it's a way of doing things that will be slotted into the pipeline somewhere. And before long, we probably won't really be talking about AI. We'll just be talking about the platforms that people are using. They're amazing. You know, you know, like it would be less about this is AI, you know, AI driven AI buzzword. It's, it's probably more about look at this, look at what this does for us. Mm. And it's amazing. And, and it will be based on platforms and names of companies and, and names of software programs. Yeah. And I yeah. wonder too, like, um, I mean, just as from like a budget perspective, it's like if you have the budget in the shoot to do a whole unreal world build or set build and control it but um you know does it also just go down where it's like making virtual production more accessible and it's like okay we just need to shoot something and we need like a kitchen scene but we're not as particular if of what the kitchen looks like does that make it more <clears throat> budget friendly think, for like other shoots oh yeah definitely i mean it's all about democratizing the technology um i feel you know the the speed of the content creation um, coming down helps make that a little bit more accessible. You know, does it does it make it a little bit more accessible to someone to be able to create a background quickly? And yeah, we've been doing a lot of R and D on this all year, like since the start of this year. I mean, we posted in January that we'd been doing beta testing with the Kubrick um, AI, and like you know, so we've been looking at that. But but it's like anything, you know, like once you. It, it requires a different workflow. So then, yeah, you get benefits somewhere, but then where's the downside? And then does that offset some of the savings like somewhere? So I think that it's still to be like completely proven for all cases. And like, um, again, you know, as, as we're really trying to push the, um, the customizable environment creation for specific narratives, for specific storytelling, um, you know, we're still focusing a lot of energy on that and obviously looking at how AI tools as they come through will help us. Um, I do feel like there's a there's definitely a, a, a speed um, element of of working with AI, which is really interesting. Um, but I'm I'm sort of I, I think the craft ultimately that comes from people, you know, is is never going to be replaced. You know, yeah. because it's never going to be replaced. Like perfect example is like yeah, well, you know, Mandalorian costs fifteen million dollars an episode, right? And so. Other shows cost a million dollar an episode. Why is that? And do we really think that that's all just going to change? Like, it's a sort of there is a craft to filmmaking that requires so many you know things coming together to kind of really make it engage and make people cry and make people laugh and you know like that craft that has been developed over years in cinematography. Elements of it could be taught, sure, but like I think that um, ultimately we're always going to need that human. Um, hand and mindset and sort of awareness to, to shift and change things. So when I look for artists and I work with our VAD team on trying to find artists, the first thing I always look for is do they have a eye as an artist, first of all, regardless of their abilities, they may be the best Unreal programmer in the world, but if they don't have the eye for art and they don't have that kind of um, ability to compose a scene, 
then you know they're they're not they're going to find it hard working in filmmaking. Uh, so let's talk about one of the let's say break down one of the projects that you did, uh, the Red Bull RB19 reveal. So yeah, can you just walk me through? Let's just start at high level, just like overview, like how that project came about and how what the production process was like. Um, so the we had had a uh, relationship with Oracle Red Bull Racing and discussing virtual production with them for some time. But they came to us on, I think it was like December the 22nd and said, uh, hey, we we need to shoot a, a launch for our RB19. We can't pivot to a traditional workflow because we don't have any time. We don't have the drivers. We don't have the RB19. Um, so we ended up using the RB19 as a plastic pig. So anyway, they 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 came to us with this idea. We said, okay, let us go away, come up with some concepts. We we started at the concept stage, which meant that we could um, fully give the virtual production opportunity its best um, ability. And then we ended up, then we had Christmas, so then everybody was very snoozy. Um, and then on the 7th of January, we got the green light to go ahead with the, the shoot. The actual shoot was the 25th and the 26th. And then we edited and graded and then delivered on the 3rd of February for the launch on um, the 4th, which is very, very quick. Uh, if anyone's familiar with production, uh, that's a very, very quick one. Um, and we but, but we were so efficient with it. And the, the team at Oracle Red Bull Racing are amazing. They're so good. They're ready to kind of take on uh, new and innovative ways of doing things, which is super helpful for us. And they'd put their trust into us to explore that with them. So we then, uh, we worked on our concepts. We we understood the, the tra trajectory of channel, like Oracle Red Bull Racing wanted to um, win the hearts of America because America had, hadn't chosen the team that they wanted to root for. So we ended up coming up with the idea of the RB19 being dropped off in Manhattan, Nevada, but it should have been dropped off in, in Manhattan, New York, which is where they were having the, the launch of the RB19 at the Classic Cars um, Club. So we, our director for this one was Chris McKenna and um, he lives out in LA. So he went with one of our producers um, who's also based in LA and did some drone shoots, um, across, went to the desert and it snowed. <laughs> like, I'm really sad and that's not what it's supposed to do. But we, we ended up doing an extra pickup day because luckily we had the time to. Um, the, they picked up uh, drone um, footage and uh, plates, car plates. So we had drones for the great big, like, you know, uh, vast wides and then we had plates that we were going to then use for the um on the volume and um, so we captured that across different places we did austin the circuit of the americas there where we were able to go around the actual track and pick up the the footage from that we used to join for that we had nevada we went all over america essentially and then we uh were able to take that drive with us um, Chris McKenna flew over. Um, that was the, like, in truth, that was the only bit of this whole production that wasn't super green. And it was that part of the, the, the flight that, that, um, Chris came over on was, you know, the, the carbon footprint element of it still was only 168 pounds GBP that we had to offset, offset. So it, Given the kind of breadth of everything that we had achieved with the production, it still was super sustainable. Um, anyway, he came over. We had our dit that was set up, who then was able to put on a, a LUT that could go. We then split that footage to our VFX team that could then work on the wides, like the Hoover Dam wide. And then we, uh, the rest of it went on to our volume. We then did the shoot. The shoot was, again, <laughs> like I said earlier, like all of the crew were like, my God, this is so much fun. And it was just such a great atmosphere. Um, the Come the second shoot day, the client were like, oh, do you know what? The, we've got all of these really beautiful shots of um, the different sponsors that were on the car, but we didn't have like the, the red bull across the front of the nose cone. And we were like, okay, well, we want to problem solve that. But we were in um, in Wakefield and we didn't have the right grip to um, 
you know, to be able to do the top down and we didn't have a green uh, piece of fabric. And we decided that we would explore, because if we'd already built these environments in Unreal that we were using, the 3D environments were there and ready with our artists. Um, we had the model of the car already in Unreal as well, because we've been using it for previs and um, working out our kind of shoot book. Um, and essentially, we rendered out a, a, a pass of the car coming out of the crate, um, which then went directly into our edit because of we we're able to, you know, build mm. such photorealistic um, captures that it could just render out straight directly and go into our Reddit, which meant that our client was super happy because of then they've also got that that winning shot. So you're saying, so this entire shot, so it's like an overhead shot looking down at the car comes out of a crate and we're looking down and we see the nose and the front wing come out with Red Bull on it. So that entire shot uh, was rendered, was a unreal. Yeah, that's, that's it. So we, we uh, did a, a kind of formula of different shots um, to put together the, the full spot. So we used 3D unreal environments on the volume. We also built driving plates in Unreal that we could then use. We rendered out and used on the volume, which is that one where you see the Miami driving a plate and then you see the rocket kind of come up in the background. So that was that was how that was done. So that was um, completely uh, virtual. Or that was rendered in Unreal. Yeah, okay. that's it. And then the um, and then so we were able to create like the smoke coming up and um, and, and encourage a bit more of that kind of atmosphere. Um, we then also had, obviously, as we mentioned, our drone shots and our car plates. Mm -hmm. um, we then cut it in with some archived footage of like Red Bull had curated and used some of their archive footage. Like winning shots then, from like the past races, like those kinds yeah, of shots. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Like them being absolutely baller um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, nod to Max Verstappen winning another one. Yeah. Uh, he is... A, well, I don't a, think a anyone could have predicted at that point how uh, dominant that this season would have been. I know. <laughs> we were like, yeah, we, we, we did that yeah. through virtual production, not really. Um, so RB19 happens, yeah. is just mega. Um, and yeah, it was super fun. And and then like part of that as well. So then um, Max and Checo did their, they recorded their lines. Mm. So they didn't have to be on set where we they had their help. Like, it's like the Mandalorian. Yeah, you know, you know. yeah, yeah, exactly. The reflection. They yes. had their helmet on, precisely. Um, uh, and then... Christian Horner, he recorded, we, we had a session with our director and Christian Horner to, to kind of um, work on the performance of some of the lines that he did. But it, it, there was, you know, they had problems. Um, they didn't, they didn't have their car. They didn't have their drivers and they needed it to be shot in like six, shot and delivered in six weeks and virtual production solved that. And we got, and also the, the car can only, uh, can only do like 50 kilometers or 50 miles for marketing purposes before it classifies as being testing. So actually they, they wouldn't have been able to do a, 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 a road trip across America in the same way unless we had done it like that. And then for the post-production schedule with the Speedy, because we'd done our VFX shots, we'd already built our edit in our pre-production. And then when we got to the actual shoot, we were then just pilling in final pixel through camera and then we slot that into our edit and then we did a grade and then we delivered um so you know speedy, yeah. speedy guy. is the speed that honestly like you could never have done this any other way like this is you know and this is what we're taking to our other clients as well and brands and saying like if you think about the technology and the possibilities that this technology is now providing, not just the virtual production stage, but as Hannah was saying, you know, the, the Unreal Engine environment, so we can repurpose environments across the whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. We could do pre and then use that pre as Hannah said, like in the final shot. And like, we, that, that's, that's true. We had pre cars that were part of the pre but they're now going in this final pixel into the edit. This stuff, like, this is groundbreaking, I think, in film and TV. And so, mm -hmm. We're trying to bring that like compression of the tech, the compre potential compression of timelines to brands and saying, well, look, you know, if you could shoot more faster, you know, to this kind of quality, you know, if you could, if you could change the speed of content creation, how might that change your campaigns? How might that change how you approach filmmaking as a whole? And I think that's the really big revolutionary thing in this is how we're through the technology side, 
shift and the change in how you approach doing things at the front end. And how might you utilize that asset in another part of your mm. um, of your workflow? So if, for example, and Oracle Rebel Racing, feel free to call us if you want us to uh, explore this. But if you then tick that uh, desert in Nevada that we built for you in Unreal and you wanted to give a um, an experience, an augmented experience to fans to come in and sit in a, in the plastic pig and feel like they were racing across a desert or on the circuit of the Americas, we can do an augmented reality experience as well as your film, as well as uh, we could create a game within that environment that allowed you to, you know, uh, jump up and down like a Super Mario Kart uh, vibe out of it. Like you could cross pollinate so many different sections of the industry but you're only paying for the environment. Well, you're probably going to have to pay a little bit more if you want all of those things. But you're only paying for the environment that you've built. You're building once, but it can be utilized across mid multiple different platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that'll tie into uh, what I want to talk about when we close up about the uh, the sphere. Because um, yeah, it seems like just all this technology is overlapping in different ways and experiences. Um, one thing, so I to clarify about one thing with the the spot. Um, so the wide, because it's a mixture of like a lot of close-up shots of the car and then wide shots that you mentioned were like drone plates. And so those were, uh, you added the car in to the plates. So it never, wasn't like the streets That's were shut it. down and you drove the... Yeah, so that was like a RV traditional. Around, uh, yeah, streets, exactly. Because yeah. the car was also, I forgot to say it was embargoed, so nobody could see it. Mm. Um, but yeah, there was also the traditional kind of VFX workflow of comping in the car on the mm -hmm. the plates that we'd shot. Yeah, got it. Um, no, that's fascinating. Did, did um, I mean? Well, the, I imagine with a lot of marketing campaigns, you do have a lot of previs and kind of rough editing beforehand, anyway. So is that pretty par for the course, anyways? Uh, by having or did anything in this process help speed up? Oh yeah, in previs and pre-pro where you're. Having that crazy post schedule, it was just like, oh, well, we already know because we're just going to, we already saw this I all. Might, we just yeah. drop it in. Can I give an example of a different shoot that we've done recently where yeah. we pre vis and it's been so efficient? So uh, we had a shoot where, um, the, where we had to shoot up a, um, a New Zealand uh, mountain and we needed to have lots of different products placed within the, um, the setup for this. And the client was very particular about, obviously, how their products look with each other and the, the choreography and the, the mise-en-scene of that. Um, and obviously, with Unreal Engine, what you're able to do is, is put in your actual camera and your actual lenses, and we could build the, uh, the foreground um, for the shot. We could then place in the product because there's lots of different workflows that you can do that with now you can even just scan in a scan a product and then put it into unreal and it then meant that we knew exactly what lens would be right for these products to be in that particular shot um how, where the environment needs to be placed like uh we're going to too much detail because it hasn't aired yet but there were there were some specifics that they wanted for the end shot to land on um, we were able to utilize that ability to kind of choreograph, for want of a better word, how we would then shoot the the, the final piece. Um, and it meant that before we'd even got to the shoot day, we pretty much signed off on everything. And especially in advertising, that's surprising because there's, you know, there's usually a few things that you need to be nailing down on on the actual shoot. But we'd, we'd cleaned it. And so we... Um, we went from a, a four-day shoot, um, and, but that was that was really breezy. Like everyone was having a great time. Like everybody was in really high spirits because of the, the pressure was off a little bit. Um, so it goes to show how much this process can streamline your uh, so many different areas: pre-production, shoot, post-production. Like we've we've seen now that where we've gotten quite uh, nimble with it. Um, we've kind of halved the amount of time it would take to do a traditional production. Like 50% we worked out that we've, we've set, like we've saved in terms of time. And now we're looking at saving around 20% worth of money as well. Like mm -hmm. the hard cash, yeah. like we're actually saving like money the total on that. Budget. 
But yeah, and then and then you know it's like up to ninety five percent more sustainable as well. Like it's but that's yeah. like it's only by approaching it as a way of filmmaking. Mm. You know, like if you approach it as um, I'm going to like phone up the studio and um, yeah, we're going to do the shoot. I might just like phone up the studio and bring my environment on a memory stick and we'll we'll come and shoot it. And then yeah, that'd be great. It'll be it'll, it'll save us money and it'll look really cool. Like you know, like that's generally you know, not going to work. Um, and you're not, or it will work, but you won't get the best out of it. Like you get something out of it, but you're not, the way to really maximize production value and this design is point that even actually reduced is to think about it as end to end, you know, from the start and work with, you know, the people who understand the production process and the workflow and pre-production and the creative review process of environments and the creation of the environments. Like it's, it's, it's not a kind of light thing to say, oh, let's just take the post-production and move it into pre, you know, that's kind of people talked about the Mandalorian a lot. Yeah, that's true. But then you need someone to manage the pre. <laughs> you can't like, yeah. you can't just like expect that then this is going to do itself. Like it needs, it needs that same kind of military approach to like post-production that we have, you know, like okay, there is a process there, there's a workflow. You need to apply that same thinking to pre. And like I say, like we, this is what we've learned from doing this now for three years is that you have to like take the holistic view the technology ultimately is a commodity. The technology can be put up in any studio in this world, but the real, you know, to get the best out of it and to be able to do things in six weeks or whatever, you need that whole formula like put together. And then that's what's really exciting. That's what makes it a way of filmmaking. That's what makes it a different way of approaching things. It's not just about going to a studio. It's actually about let's all get in the brain of like who we might do this in a very different way using this technology. And to add, and I'm surprised that I haven't said these two words at least 10 times already, but risk mitigation is so key in this. Like the, the technology, um, whilst we've got a good handle on it, it's complicated. And if, if you're not thinking about it from a point of view of risk mitigating, then that's when those horror stories that you hear where they, they did virtual production and then it all looked bad and then so they did it all in post afterwards. And the only reason that that has occurred is not because of the technology, it's because of the lack of risk mitigation. Yeah, I think that just popped up on like a Reddit thread of someone that was like, I've been on virtual production shoots and everyone I've been on, they've like rotoscoped everyone out and like replaced the backgrounds because uh, it doesn't work. And it's like... Yeah, and I don't think we've done that once. No, like in fact, ninety-five percent. I think what we've done has been Final Pixel because we Final came at it in that way. From I mean, you got to live up to the name. I mean, that's something yeah, right. yeah, that's <laughs> weird. Exactly. We came out because, like, when we saw the Mandalorian, we we're like, "That's great, let's go do that." Like, we didn't know at that point they wrote it all, like, or however much it <laughs> wrote it. We were like, "This is why this is what like got us to the point of the art and everything." I'm saying, like, you know, because we we wanted to generate and create as much as we can in camera because. It, takes you back to a different way of filmmaking as well, which is much more, I think, like exciting for everyone on set, you know, going back to like what Hannah was saying, we've had shoots that people can be so much more invested in this type of a shoot, getting around the monitor to like, see how it's all looking, see how it's all coming together. Like it's exciting again, it's, it's shifting something. Um, and, you know, that goes all the way from, you know, all the way up the chain in terms of the production team, but also, as Hannah said, clients, you know, like having producers and people be able to just see and sign off then what they've what they've seen and send it into the edit with a number of shots. I mean, yeah, sure, you can work with VFX, but this is not, there's been a misnomer that this is a VFX form of technology. This is, in, and it's not helped to call it ICVFX and these sort of things, because it's not, it's live action filmmaking, it's live production, it's the live bit is what makes it what it is. We also do live events and live shows because our team has learned, and you know, we work with teams as well that have the, the live event um, kind of mentality, which is what this is like. You're you're basically doing you know post live on set in front of everyone, yeah. everyone watching. <laughs> you know, like it's a real challenge and it's a real kind of different skill set. And I think that because of that production background and that mentality, like one of our clients is Warner Brothers Discovery, and they know us for being buttoned up, like we are tight on our because of that kind of risk assessment um mentality of things which means that we serve them as a client in a way that they can have, have confidence and trust in us and i think that's uh key going back to like filmmaking i mean so how many times on set i mean obviously tons of pre-pro goes into this but how many times are you on set and just being able to see what you're filming 
does some sort of spontaneity come up or something happen where you're like, oh, we can actually like shift the camera a little bit this way or get a different shot this way because we can see it. Like, well, I, I have yes. one example of that. So with, uh, we did this um, piece for um, BBC Studios called Once on This Familiar Spot. And we realized that uh, David, honestly, the, the contributor, he was um, able, we were like, why don't we track that torch? Why don't we track that uh, art department torch that you have? So that when you shine it into the environment, and this was on the shoot day, when we shine it into the environment, that light can then shine in real time on the environment as well. And that's like the the more uh, the more you're not worrying about the technology, the more freedom that you have to be creative, and the more like these kind of little bits can pop up, and you can realize that there's even more opportunity. Yeah, I would say that like back to Anne's point, we've been doing risk mitigation a lot so um and again that's about like working with clients like red bull and working with warner brothers and working with you know shutterstock and sky and other you know we have to make sure we're buttoned up and that we're delivering really high production value for this so risk mitigation is key but at the same time like you know we are allowing more control back in like we're trying to bring more and more control back in on set so that you can have more and more you know happy accidents and things you know you can have many more things that um, because the technology is there to do it, it's just about having it, you know, as I say, brought into this process in a way which we're managing the risks. And so our world building team, which we'll hear a lot more about next year into 2024, there's a lot of work going on there at the moment, but you'll see the type of thing we're talking about, which is about bringing that control back again. So yeah, you can have your beautiful environments, you can have all this stuff, but look, we also want to make sure the directors and the DOPs can have that craft that they really want, you know, um, beyond some of the kind of basic stuff that you can do with our new and beyond kind of trying to lock everything in before we get on set. We kind of, we're kind of setting the rule book for virtual production by saying, you know, this is how you do it. But we're also in the background tearing that up and, we're gonna, and it's going to change. <laughs> so like anyone who thinks that virtual production is like, there's a rule or this is how it works. Like you're kidding yourself. This is completely changing every month. You know, it is changing every month already, you know, water foliage this time last year. Oh, don't go near water foliage now bring it on, it looks amazing. Like this is like, you cannot good. write, like this is what's good for, this is what's bad for, and like stand by that for months because it's changing so fast and that's that's what we do. Like we're right at the front, this is where we're calling ourselves, you know, innovation works. Like we're constantly having to innovate in the face of all these changes and find ways to then bring that control and bring these new features to um, filmmakers. We're scratching the surface as well. We're like, it, we've, there's so much potential and so much opportunity and uh, like just on the water and foliage point, like um, so, w one of our environment artists had been working on um, uh, in Lay Lake in Myanmar, and um, we had like a little demonstration, internal demonstration of it. And before she'd even said where it was, I was like, "Oh my god, I've been there! I've been, I've been to In Lay Lake." And then Chris Bouchard, our VP supervisor, he so his background was like. Frame store, ILM, Lux Machina, now he's with us. And he's a magician. Um, just in case you hear it, Chris. Um, the uh you know, the he'd been to Inlay Lake as well. And we were all like, oh my goodness, like talking about when we were in Myanmar and how, you know, and it it conjures up all of this really evocative experience. Um the, the it was it like the water is amazing. The way the most the water moves, like the and, you know, the way that it was built, like, it's just it's so impressive what you can do. Uh, I know we're coming up on time. Last question. So we had the Vegas Sphere, the Vegas Race, F1 Race just happened. So what are your thoughts of a lot of the, you know, Sphere has been getting a lot of buzz, but it's using a lot of the same technology that's in virtual production. We just mentioned, like, yes, you could take these assets and potentially do things with them. So, like, what are you thinking of the, ver like, sort of just the future of immersive experiences? I mean, when I would... Yeah, I would love to make a, a film, you know, for something like that. And and this comes from the same thinking, if you like, that we apply to what we're doing, right? It's like, if now you know the technology and the possibilities of kind of what you can do there, how do you then bring that all the way for, as far up the chain as possible to when you're concepting and creative or writing a script? You know, write a script for the sphere that is a, a film, you know, like a, in our sense, you know, a, a drama, something that, you know, you could actually tell in a different way, like, I find it amazing thinking about how in a big space like that you could you could zoom into like a really small square of it and you could bring everyone's attention into that. All as part of a 
a story, all as part of the storytelling experience, you know, like not an abstract thing, not a demonstration, but, you know, part of a script that we've written and like, you know, take someone's attention into that small area and then like at other moments, you know, explode around them and bigger and, and, you know, I'm sure people are already doing this, but I would love to be able to like write something that was specifically based around, mm -hmm. you know, um, that sort of, you know, experience. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, like, how do you then, what, bring in actors and you could have like a live performance that goes with it as well. And you could think, well, how else could we tell this story? You know, and it's about taking that um, technology and um, importantly bringing it all the way up to the storytelling. And that's, that's you know, like there's been, there's been people doing courses for writing in Unreal, for example, in the last couple of years, but like there's still a big gap in that area, I think, you know, and, and, and um, you know, and, and being able to sort of go from that early script screenplay stage and then turn it into something which is really going to take advantage of this technology. But that would be for the inside, obviously. I don't know if Hannah, you've got any ideas for the outside. My own man. And, and mine was really boring, actually. I was like, well, we should just, like, for the outside, we should just create what was there. So then you could, it's probably, you probably can't do that for, like, aviation purposes, just in case anything flies into yeah. it. But, like, if you then just, re like, replicated what the landscape would have looked like before, and so the sphere just disappeared. Just here they do, like, these wraparounds, the utility boxes that'll be, like, it's mm. wrapped with, like, a photo of yeah. if it wasn't there, what it would yeah. look like. Yeah. yeah. So just a giant wraparound of an invisible yeah. sphere. Yeah. I love it. You'd have, like, a little, like, wormhole or something in it where you're like, oh, it looks like the skyline, but there's something a little off with it or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's purple. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great. Uh, where can people find out more info? And I know you've got your own podcast you just relaunched. So, like, what... Uh, yeah, we, um, Anna can tell you about the inner first Um We've also got our website, you know, findingpixel.com. Best thing you'll have to do is follow us on um, social media, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, that's where you get all the latest. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, Joey's podcast, because, you know, hopefully we can come back next time and tell yeah. you more about world builders in particular next year, like once that all starts to ramp up. I'm definitely down for yeah, part we'll two. Keep this conversation open. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, thank Joey. you so much. Thanks for having us. And that's a wrap for this episode of VP Land. Many thanks to Michael and Hannah for coming onto the show. You can find links to any of the projects or videos mentioned in the show notes for the episode. Also, if you're listening to this, we have a video version of the episode that has videos of everything we're talking about edited into the video. So be sure to check that out on our YouTube channel, easiest way, ntm.link slash YouTube. And also remember, sign up for our newsletter, ntm.link slash VP Land. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review in your podcast app of choice. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. And also in the YouTube comments, let us know your thoughts. Let me know what you think and who you'd like to see on the podcast next. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.